HistoryTube, a community that I once cherished for their entertaining, based yet educational content, has of recent been overtaken by world culture. With the exception to a few history channels that I still respect for sticking with truth over agenda, the bigger and notable history YouTubers have in the past two or three years been drinking the SJW Kool-Aid. For the most part, HistoryTube no longer dedicates itself towards accuracy or truth. Instead, it centers on crafting core historical research into a deceptive agenda as a way to indoctrinate its audience on leftism and wokeness. I experienced this firsthand when Cynical Historian banned me from his Discord for correcting him on a fraudulent chart that he cited in which it combined two different data sets from separate sources that used completely different metrics. This video, however, isn't about Cypher. Instead, I will be responding to another history YouTuber, Tristan, who goes by the alias Step Back. Unlike other members of HistoryTube who at least know what the hell they're talking about, every minute of Tristan's videos are pounded with inaccuracy after inaccuracy after inaccuracy. His video lecture on the history of Puerto Rico, which by the way, I am Puerto Rican, had so many inaccuracies that when compared to the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith was far more accurate at documenting the history of the Americas than Tristan, who thought that barbecued pork ribs and bacon would be a great visual representation of a traditional Taino diet. In addition to being factually wrong about every subject, the way he projects evidence and events in his content is executed deceptively as a way to support his anarcho-communist agenda. A prime example of this is his video on the militarization of the police, for which my response will be centering on. Because how many inaccuracies contained in Tristan's video, I will be splitting my response into multiple parts. Right on the bat, Tristan begins with quick edits of cherry-picked news footage of BLM riots that showed law enforcement quelling down peaceful demonstrations in quotation marks with fortified trucks and tear gas. He even includes this clip where a reporter remarks that the police acted disproportionately over what he considers to be a non-violent protest. This is a disproportionate response against predominantly non-violent protests. As you will notice, Tristan never discusses the severity of the violence, looting, and damage that occurred as a result of these riots. This is because Tristan is trying to mislead his audience to believe Lenko armored vehicles, tear gas, and assault weapons are immoderately used by the police in scenarios such as mostly peaceful protests. And when I say peaceful, I'm referring to demonstrators flipping over patrol cars, attacking officers with fireworks, looting local stores dry, gang shootings, and causing tens of millions of dollars in property damage. Not to mention that during George Floyd's protest last year, 700 buildings were destroyed, including the Minneapolis police station, which was completely decimated after law enforcement evacuated the building with little to no attempt to quelling off the mob. The looting and destruction were so bad, the city residents had to rely on food aid, as if it were the aftermath of a natural disaster. In addition to downplaying riots, Tristan plays on the emotions by projecting the police as a militant, authoritarian, and brutal arm of the state, and compares cops to iron-plated peacekeepers depicted in dystopian fantasy. We've heard quite a bit about the institution of the police lately. We see officers in places like Portland or Minneapolis sporting military weapons, driving armored personnel carriers, and dressed like the jackboots from a dystopian 70s film. It's hard to see these people in your neighborhood without feeling like you're under attack. Tristan is clearly being deceptive by including an image of a modified police tank since these types of track vehicles are not used in combating riots due to how uncommon they are and that they are slow, heavy, and if not driven carefully, can seriously damage paved roads. In addition, police tanks do not have cannons or firing shells and are only really used in crossing rugged terrain, particularly for rescue missions in places that are not accessible by regular motor vehicles. Wait, wasn't police tanks banned by Obama in 2015 before getting unbanned by Trump? I'll return back to this when Tristan starts talking about why Orange Man bad. In the meantime, let's address Lenko armored vehicles, which look like tanks but aren't actually tanks. These are common, but you could definitely expect to see one at any Black Lives Matter or Antifa protests. There was even one shown in one of the selected news clips being used in Ferguson. It is shocking to see police officers in big heavy armored vehicles firing tear gas at crowds of people. Of course, that is not concerning that these officers had to deal with mobs vandalizing cars and throwing rocks and glass bottles at them. Here's video evidence taken in Ferguson of non-violent protesters flipping over a patrol car, something that would be impossible to do 
into an armored police vehicle. It is as if Tristan believes that law enforcement should be as vulnerable as possible to civilian violence, undermining the catastrophic consequences of having a weak police force in a country in which rioting had literally turned cities into guerrilla war zones. Also, America isn't Pan Am. We have the Bill of Rights to protect citizens from any form of police state. Continuing to the video, Tristan unsurprisingly gets a trigger warning before reminding the viewer that he or she has white privilege. If images and stories of police assaulting citizens is news to you, congratulations on being born white. I am sorry to all my POC viewers, I have to explain something you're all painfully familiar with to people like me who grew up with a complexion that allows us to live with our eyes and ears firmly closed. Ironic that Tristan, a Canadian, is guilting white Americans for being colorblind when his country is iconic for its cordial mountain police and being disproportionately more white than the United States. Of course, I'm proving his point by implying that Tristan is privileged in living in a predominantly Caucasian nation. However, to imply that white Americans are too colorblind to be confronted with news of police brutality when in actuality more whites had been killed by police since 2015 than African Americans. Although it is true that when accounting for population, blacks are killed at higher rates by police than whites. A study by the PNAS shows that there is no significant evidence of an anti-black disparity in the likelihood of being fatally shot by police, but rather that the rate of county-level violent crime. Tristan then claims that the institution that would become policing in the United States was a product of British colonialism and slave patrol. The TLDL of the podcast is that the institution of what would become policing in America began in colonial times based on a system of sheriffs and militias the British developed through the colonization of the Irish. After independence, American policing focused on slave patrols in the South and the suppression of organized labor in the North. For a guy who likes to play historian on the internet, he is clearly ignorant on the origins of British and American policing. To be fair though, he isn't per se claiming this, rather he was paraphrasing Robert Evans. Nevertheless, it is factually false that American policing originated from the exploitation and colonization of the Irish. This is in reference to the Royal Irish Constabulary, or RIC for short, an English militia founded in the early 19th century to quell off Irish nationalist rebellions. Now it could be that Tristan misspoke, but it sounds like he is implying that these sheriffs and militias deriving from the RIC began back when the US was the 13 colonies. The institution of what would become policing in America began in colonial times based on a system of sheriffs and militias the British developed through the colonization of the Irish. I am 100% certain that he is referring to the RIC since other leftists had made similar claims of this organization being the first modern police force. However, to assert that these sheriffs and militias that the 13 colonies emulated came from the RIC is ridiculous since 1. The Royal Irish Constabulary was established in 1822. 46 years after the US Declaration of Independence, meaning that it wouldn't be possible for the colonists to emulate something that would not exist until around the time of James Monroe's second term as President of an independent United States. 2. The system of sheriffs and militias in question was not developed from the RIC, as the first modern police force was the City of Glasgow Police. The Glasgow City Police can be said to have a bigger and more significant role in establishing establishing modern British and American policing. Glasgow, the largest city in Scotland, initially had a short-lived privately financed police force lasting from 1779 to 1781. After the first city police disbanded due to financial troubles, the Glasgow City Council would set up a committee of six in formulating these guidelines for a new police force. This committee that would help found the Glasgow City Police conscribe the core guidelines and traditions that are still relevant today. This includes the use of uniforms, badges, officers having to swear an oath, and performing duties such as street patrol, detecting house and shop break-ins, and pop picking, gathering information on crimes, suppressing riots, and controlling carts and carriages. Although the new police force only lasted two years due to, once again, the lack of financial support, it was very effective. So effective, in fact, that it inspired Patrick Calcown, a member of the Merchant Council, who would later write down the concept 
of preventative policing in his book, A Treatise on the Police of the Metropolis. In 1795, this book would later inspire the Glasgow Police Act in 1800, which resurrected the City of Glasgow Police, but with royal financial assistance. And the Metropolitan Police Act of 1829, which established England's first Metropolitan Police. In addition, the concept of sheriffs dates all the way back to 12th century Scotland when King David I would appoint Reeves to be in charge of local responsibilities within counties or shires as it was called back then. Reeves were in charge of certain tasks such as ensuring serfs were working on time, neighborhood watch, and of course stopping crime. The term Shire Reeve would evolve to become the word sheriff. The problem with the claim that American policing derived from slave patrol is that early American police departments started out in the north, mainly in large cities such as New York, Boston, and Chicago, and was founded to emulate the UK as a way to replace Knights Watchmen that had become unpractical due to high population growth. In addition, during the Reconstruction, a time in which Northern troops occupied Southern states after defeating the Confederacy, at least 12 Southern cities had black members in their police force, including New Orleans and even a town in Mississippi in which they had a black sheriff. Tristan goes on about the evolution of U.S. policing through the 20th century, where he eventually talks about the repression of political demonstrators during the civil rights era, in particular the Watts riots of 1965. Many police saw success in using military weapons and tactics to put them down, like the Watts riot of 1965 in Los Angeles, which started when the LAPD beat the shit out of a 20-year-old black man in front of a crowd. The black community of LA broke out in understandable anger against the racism and brutality done by the police. To de-escalate the situation, the government sent in the California National Guard to brutally quell the riots, killing over 30 people and injuring thousands in the process. Of course, just like the BLM riots, Tristan avoids discussing the violence perpetrated by quote-unquote peaceful protesters. The Watts riots was far more complicated and a lot of important truths were left out by Tristan. In reality, the riots came to be due to misunderstanding among the crowd that led to them retaliating against the police. In addition, the riot was far more violent and destructive than implied. The truth is that it all started when a 21-year-old in question, Marquette Fry, was pulled over for a DUI. Although Fry initially was calm and collected, it wasn't until his mother showed up and nagged him for driving it drunk with her car that he became enraged and resisted arrest. A fight ensued between Fry, his mother, and the police, all occurring in front of a group of bystanders. Fry even attempted to disappear into the crowd before one of the cops tried to hit Fry in the arm with a baton but missed hitting his head instead. As the police were about to leave the scene, a female bystander spat on one of the cops before she was viciously resisted arrest and was aggressively dragged away. The crowd mistook her for being pregnant, spreading a rumor that the police had assaulted a pregnant woman. The bystanders retaliated by throwing bottles and pieces of concrete at the police. As one would expect, the rioters looted stores and burned down buildings. Mobs will approach white drivers who weren't even cops, pull them out of their vehicles, and beat them up. They also attack motorists with rocks and bricks. They even blocked the fire department to prevent them from extinguishing the inflamed buildings, causing further property damage. Damage that would cost the city $40 million. Those who witnessed the riots describe it as a war zone with the Watts police chief even comparing the violence to a Viet Cong insurgency. It was so bad that the heads of the NAACP, community leaders, and even Marquette Fry himself conducted a community meeting to demand writers to stop and go home. One of the writers interrupted the meeting by stealing one of the speaker's microphone to proclaim that they planned to target white neighborhoods. Most will agree that hate crimes committed against white people and burning entire blocks is unacceptable. Knowing these facts, it is right to infer that these actions taken by law enforcement were necessary for the protection of Los Angeles. And Marquette would actually agree with me, since he himself was irritated by the woke narrative and the unwanted attention from race baiters. Delving back into the video, Tristan asserts that the police were militarized as a way to repress minorities, hippies, and the anti-war movement. Beginning with the Law Enforcement Assistance Act of 1965, which granted federal financial resources in training state and local law enforcement. That same year, Congress passed the Law Enforcement Assistance Act. Or LEAA, 
skyrocketing resources given to police at various levels around the country for training and, quote, projects designed to improve the capabilities, techniques, and practices of state and local agencies charged with law enforcement and related responsibilities. While the LEAA did address new counter-riot training and techniques, however, the act itself deals with training and finances for combating all crimes in general. The LEAA was along with other acts were part of LBJ's war on crime. Yes, that LBJ, the president cherished by modern progressives for passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and his war on poverty. The war on crime initiative was a response to the rise of crime, which included violent crime and theft during the mid-1960s. Tristan then makes this assertion. Police also felt the need to crack down on the kids who didn't want to die in a pointless war in Vietnam. How dare they? So to ensure there was never another civil rights or anti-war movement, the police needed some powerful, deadly toys to suppress them. Hence why police went from looking like this to looking like this. That's odd. Why did he transition from police from the 60s to 21st century cops in military style uniforms when talking about police gadgets in the 1970s? Seems that Tristan is once again being deceptive to his audience. If the police really went from snowball helmets and batons to becoming starship troopers in the 70s, then how come I don't see any examples of robo-cops existing in the rest of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s? Here's a picture taken in the 80s of an American cop wearing anti-riot gear. Looks almost the same as those goofy snowball cops from the 60s. Here's another photo, but this time taken during the 1992 LA riots. Ten years later and they're still wearing snowballs. This image right here does appear to show a change in police wear with leg braces and bulletproof vests. But what if I told you this here isn't the American police? In fact, this is a picture of British law enforcement wearing anti-riot gear in the 1980s. Here is another picture taken in the 80s, this time taken in South Korea during a 1987 pro-democracy protest. It appears that the change in uniform conduct and gear was a global phenomenon rather than something originating in America to combat race riots and anti-war protests. This is the fun part in which I debunk Tristan on the war on drugs. Listen up, mistress, and you too, sisters. Let's talk about something that's a real brain twister. Tristan regurgitates the same old leftist narrative that the war on drugs was set up in a way to incarcerate people of color, questioning why it didn't go after nicotine or alcohol when cannabis is a way safer substance. Let's talk about the war on drugs. From the beginning, the whole concept seemed a little odd. Why isn't nicotine or alcohol on this list when cannabis is a much safer substance? That's a little weird, isn't it? He is forgetting or most likely ignoring that at the time, the production of alcohol was still heavily regulated and it wasn't until 1978 that home brewing was legalized. In addition, nicotine doesn't have the neurotic side effects that cannabis has. Also, the intellectual understanding of certain drugs wasn't as accurate as it is today. Tristan regurgitates another leftist talking point that despite equal use of cannabis across racial lines, blacks are disproportionately arrested more than whites. Also seemed a little unequal in its enforcement. Despite equal use of cannabis across racial lines, it seems to have been enforced overwhelmingly on, you know, black and brown people. This narrative has been refuted to death by the likes of actual Justice Warrior. To summarize, the white, black, and Hispanic people do intake cannabis equally. Blacks and Latinos are more likely to smoke pot, weed, or other forms of cannabis outside or in public. In New York City, 90% of marijuana arrests are correlated with complete calls to the police, mostly by neighbors or Karens who complain about potheads smoking in stoops parks or corners. In addition, these complaints are reported from in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods, especially with higher crimes. The rest of Tristan's video continues to ramble about the war on drugs being a plot by Richard Nixon and Reagan to purge black people and leftists, along with his conclusions in which he suggests to defund the police and replace them with social workers. But you would have to wait for part two to hear my rebuttal on that. On the meantime, please like and share this video, leave your thoughts in the comments below, and subscribe to my channel. And remember, all commies are bad.